The opinions expressed in the following program are not necessarily those of Eastlink TV, its sponsors, or partners. Hi there, I'm Gloria McCluskey. You're watching Destination Dartmouth. My destination this morning is Lake City Cidery here on Portman Street, and my guest is Poet Camo, who will tell us all about cider making. Hi, Poet. Hi. Thank you for being here this morning. I know how busy you are. All yeah. you need to do is look around here, yeah. and you can tell how busy you are. Mm -hmm. So you're a Dartmouth girl. I am, yeah. Born, not born here. I was born in BC actually, but it was brief and then grew up here. My parents were both from the East Coast and uh, the draw of family kind of pulled them back after they had two Great. kids. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So now you're into cider making. I am. Let's go back a little bit on your background. Okay. So um, I guess I started in cider. I've been uh, a small yay the past eight years. And I, that kind of uh, that kind of trajectory started with selling alcohol. I, I got a job um, with uh, Atlanta Spirits and Wines, which is a, a local agency that sells an array of products from wine, spirits, beer. And um, it just I'm kind of a, I'm a curious person, and uh, I always like to learn more and know more. Which right. that's how I started. Okay, if, I, if I'm selling wine, I want to know more about wine. Sure. And so that was my smell all the A, and then. So, yeah, you touch, it's a lot of theory, but you touch on production. And I was always fascinated with kind of how everything was made and hands-on. Um, I was lucky enough to... So you, so you were a good staff member? <laughs> yeah. That you were like yeah. curious? Yeah, and, and um, they were good to me. And, um, you know, they also saw that me getting more education and more knowledge was made me more credible as an employee as well. So it was beneficial for both sides, I think. And I was lucky because they supported that. And um, I was lucky enough to go to New Zealand and spend some time on a winery. Oh, and, did um, you? I just did whatever they needed. It was harvest because New, Zeal New Zealand's opposite to us with it when it comes to seasons. So I went in March, right? And it, that's when they harvest. And um, I got to squish grapes and, <laughs> on and <your> feet? <laughs> yeah, actually, yes. <laughs> oh, you did. So when they do, when you do your lab work um, to know when to pick. Yeah. You do a very small pressing, and the best way to do it, and it, I mean, it, it's not romantic like you see on TV, but um, you, the best way to do it, just a quick little pressing would be just with your feet, and um, you just take the juice, and then you measure all your sugar levels and your acidity and your pH, and then you know, okay, should we cook, should we pick these rows, or should we wait? And um, I got to be part of that, and then I saw some large pressings, which I did not do with my feet. It was a big vat that could press it. <laughs> No. Not in the big production. No, in massive. How, how yeah. different are their wine fields from ours? Um, they're not called fields. Yeah, so vineyards to orchards. Orchards. Um, they're, I mean, I think it's still a lot of times when you talk about really good wine, you talk about the kind of health and state of your vineyard. And the better vineyard you have and the more you take care of your grapes, the better you can have, have grapes wines. this year. Do you? I love that. Not enough for wine. No, but maybe some jelly or something. I have grapes. Who knows? Oh, yeah, they're beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Um, but orchards, orchards are kind of the same way. The, the better you take care of your orchard, the better oh. apples you have, and then the better um, you know, cider that you can make. Also, it's about varietals, too, different varietals like grapes, different varietals of apples, yeah. make different styles Dif of cider. Yeah. So it is very, uh, too, have Did a lot of Did they do ice wine in New Zealand or could they? A little bit, but I took some of ours over and they oh, were very you? impressed. Oh. Very impressed. Yeah. Can they make ice wine over yeah, there? Yeah, anyone can really. I mean, some places you kind of do it artificially where you bring the grapes and you freeze them and then you press. Oh, yeah. So it's not quite like here where they freeze on the vine and then you press, but. Um, so you went from being a Somalia yeah. to Making cider. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, Were you nervous? Um, no, I, I, ner I mean, there's been moments. I'm sure I've been anxious and nervous about different um, stages of it, but it seemed like every step I took towards, um, you know, I took, I took vacation from my last job to go do a course, a uh, production course in Oregon. And it's kind of nervous when I think I, you know, submitted and actually paid for the course and went, oh my gosh, I'm actually doing this. But when I got on the plane and when I was there, it, it kind of reconfirmed Where'd what I was doing. Where did you have to take the course? I went to Corvallis, 
which is uh, the agricultural center for the uh, University of Oregon, mm -hmm. and a beautiful campus. I was there in the summer, so it was like a ghost town, but um, the course was amazing, uh, very beneficial, and it just, again, it was a, a step that I took, and I put myself out there, but kind of reaffirmed that I was doing what I really wanted to be doing. Are you a um, risk taker? Absolutely. <laughs> I, I'm a sucker for challenge, you know, um, which I think is amazing, but also at the same time, it's kind of like, man, why do I constantly want to challenge myself this yeah. way? I uh, always challenge myself all through life. Yeah. You need a challenge in your life. I, I don't sit still very long. No. I don't do it very well. Well, you're in a great location here in the old yes. Nyforth building. Yes. Which was so well known, Nyforth yeah. furniture here. And yeah. I bought all my furniture. From you Nyforth. and a lot of people. Yeah. We've had a lot of really great response from um, the community and, and their old customers um, coming in and, and remembering their furniture that they right. bought. Yeah. And and we used one of their, you know, we used the name Nyforth for one of our ciders. I know. Because to me, a family run business for 80 years in one location is pretty phenomenal. I guess so. And is. you know, and they always had a really great reputation on the they street. They did a great reputation. Um, all the neighbors thought and have said really nice things about them. And that that that's that kind of integrity means something to me. And I hope as a business owner and and, yeah. and as a it rubs fellow off. neighbor, I wanna <laughs> I wanna be that. I wanna have a good yeah. I'm sure you will. Yeah. I yeah. wanna be a good neighbor. Yeah. I, I you know, I love Dartmouth. Yeah, Dartmouth's a great spot. Yeah. And you have a great spot here on Portland I, Street. It's I call it, you know, I have these big windows and I po I call it Portland Street TV. It's yeah, it's yeah. a it's a very busy street. And you open the windows. And you open them up. So you're right on the street then yeah. almost. It's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, it's it lots of natural light. It's uh it's, yeah, it's great. It's been it's, a great summer for that too. Yeah, it's been a very quick four weeks since we've opened and yeah. um, people are just excited about Dartmouth and, and all these changes right now in, in the downtown core. But so much has happened. Well, and I think the canteen is a, a year and a half canteen's in. Canteen's You great. know, we have the creperie that just opened up the bubble shop with I their know, ice cream. I know, And, uh, which, they have and lineups. The, and the train. And then the, tr and the train yard, which has, Where I mean. they sell the good Dartmouth shirts. The Dartmouth shirts, and they support other local craftsmen yeah. that. And there's a new little restaurant down the street. I'm trying to think of the which name one? of it. Oh, Good Luck Cafe. Yeah. I was there yesterday. Were you? And their juices are amazing. They do fresh. Oh, is that right? Fresh, fresh juices. juices. Yes. All these really um, unique offerings. And they're all different. And it's all dynamic. And it's just very a very community feel. And, it, you know, when I opened the first day, I had all these cards and flowers. And, and they're all from different What's businesses the on the street. And it really touched me because, you know, it really felt like it wasn't any kind of competition, it was no, more like No, everybody better... working together. Yes. Uh, Poet, we're going to take a break Perfect. in a minute, and we're moving in back, Okay. and you're going to tell us yes, all about making the cider. Yeah. <laughs> this is Destination Dartmouth. I'm Gloria McCluskey, and I'm here with my guest, Poet Camo, and we're here at Lake City Cider here on Portland Street. Be right back. Hi, I'm back. My guest this morning is Poet Camo, and we're here in the production room, and she's going to tell us all about cider making. Yeah, this is it. This is where the magic happens. This is where yeah, it happens. Yeah, as they say. Um, so so yeah. start at the beginning. So, okay, so we, uh, we don't press. The only thing we don't do, uh, we're an urban cidery, so we don't first, press. First, we'll start, what's, what does the cider contain? Oh, apples. Apples. And Again, you know, going back to you know how this all happened, is um, my my dad was uh, born in Wolfville, so I was very familiar with, with the valley, very familiar with all the you know you picks, and I you picked every summer with them, um, and I knew we had an abundance of apples, wonderful Nova Scotian apples, and you know, I thought, why aren't more people making cider, right? And a lot of people don't even know what cider is, which is to me mind blowing because I've always loved it. Um, so that kind of, that was, again, part of the whole story is that, you know, I knew we had this uh, accessibility to apples and Nova Scotia apples, local apples. And um, so it kind of start, started with that. And so we, um, we work with obviously local farmers, 
all our ciders are 100% Nova Scotia apples. So what kind of apples do you use? Right now we use a blend of apples. So we use some Macintosh, Cortland's, uh, Northern Spy, uh, some Russet, and uh, Johanna Gold. And a blend allows us to do different things. And, um, and also, uh, you know, gives us a good kind of structure to the cider as well. Um, so we press, we don't press on site, we press in the you valley. You don't press on site. No, and, and at Sterling they actually whole press, which means every time we order, they take their cold store apples as whole, press, and then pump it into our totes, or we have thousand liter totes, we, we usually fill five of them at a time. And uh, they bring us the fresh cider, you know, basically it looks just like farmer's cider, you know the stuff you get at the market, um, it's kind of cl a bit cloudy, dark, kind right. of. Um, we bring it here within 24 hours, we pump it into one of our fermenters and um, start the process of making cider here on Portland Street, which is kind of cool. So is it just apples? Uh, it's, well, last week we released our first one that where we blended with um, uh, Lemon Dogs, which is another Dartmouth business. Obviously there's no lemons grown in Nova Scotia, but we thought it, they were a great business to work sure. with. And um, we made a lemonade cider called the Lemon Drop. So I'm totally open to making ciders with a bunch of different things. Um, I have some, I'm working with right now on some strawberries that we'll probably oh, that release as great. a limited edition, but, um, but the base and most of our ciders are apples and they are all Nova Scotian. So, um, cause it wouldn't be cider without apples. No, <laughs> couldn't be. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, so we pump the juice in and then basically we take over the process from there. So we ferment. So cider is more similar to wine than it is to say beer when it comes to the production right, yeah. side. We're not boiling. We don't have any mash tons. We don't. No. Uh, basically, we, 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 you pick your yeast that you want to use. Yeast has as, almost as much influence over the style of cider as do the varietals so themselves. So you put yeast in there. So we put some yeast. We get it going. Um, there's lots of great sugar in apples, so the, the, those yeasts like all that nice ap um, apple sugar, and it ferments away. And it's usually about a six to eight week process where it ferments, and then you want to rack it, and you, we do a lot of filtering. Uh, we do filter all our ciders right now. I know some people like cloudy ciders, but we filter ours. Yeah, yours are very clear. Mm -hmm. So you do that. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I do it. I do it all. So they bring in the fermented. I mean the crushed apples. That's right. It's yep. juice when it comes. It's juice. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, logistically, it also just made sense. If I were to buy apples and press here, yeah. I would actually have to take all that pulp and all the yeah. cells back somewhere where it could be used, which means it could go all the way back to the farms because sure. they use it as fertilizer. Oh, well, it's the best thing to do. So uh, it made way more sense just to take the juice, they keep the fertilizer basically, and put it back into the to to their crops. Uh, because it's good for the soil. Okay, so now you pump that into one of these yep. big tank, what do you yeah. call them? These tank? are our fermenters. Yeah, fermenters. yeah just fermenter how, tanks. How much juice? So we put 5,000 liters of juice into one tank at a time, which gives it a little bit of space on top just so that the, the yeast and everything has a bit of, we call so, it head space. So we look at that and there's juice and yeast in there. Yeah. Is that right? Yep, yeah. yep. Yeah. And it is Fermenting. Mm -hmm. So for, yeah, so the fermenting. So technically, what yeasts are? Yeasts are these little tiny, um, you know, organisms that eat sugar. And when they eat sugar, they produce alcohol and they produce CO2. So those are the two things they give off, which is great because CO2 um, fills the headspace, so it keeps the oxygen out. Because oxygen, when you're making cider, is just like wine, is is what you don't want. You don't want too much oxygen in there. Um, and then that's where you get the alcohol is from those yeast bodies. Um, and, uh, and they're great. They'll eat every single last drop of sugar if you let really? them. Oh, yeah. Yep. It's, a pretty, it's, it's honestly a pretty amazing How much yeast would you thing. put in a fermenter? Um, it's, uh, for for 5,000 liters, you're probably looking at at least um, one kilo of, of yeast. Cider making, you, we use, we use uh, commercial grade yeast. Um, I know a lot of breweries, they can make kind of yeast and they keep them, they can keep them going. Um, and then they inoculate with like fresh yeast every time that they've kind of, um, 
in a way created themselves because a lot of times yeast can kind of morph into whatever the atmosphere so whatever is floating yeast yeast are everywhere yeasts are on everything so you can actually do wild ferments where you just let the cider like if i just let the cider come in and sit in a tank it would actually ferment on its own because there's yeast that sit on the skins of the, the yeast apple does it faster does it the commercial yeast controls what esters will happen out of the fermentation process so if you I mean, I've, I've had some ciders that are amazing that are wild, but if you don't know what the what wild yeasts are on there, you can kind of get some funky funky yeah. stuff happening. Yeah, is there a chance that you get too much yeast? No, no, because there's only so much sugar, so it's kind of the food source that dictates what happens. Um, you can't really over over yeast anything. So I noticed on the fermenters, there's a gauge. Yes. So we do a few things. Um, I don't, this tank, this tank behind me here is sweating. Um, the dimpled area of the tank is actually, it's what we call a glycol jacket. We pump, um, on our roof we have a glycol unit um, and it pumps cold liquid around the jacket which m makes it so that I can keep the temperature. Hold that thought, okay. poet, we're out of time. <laughs> I'm here with Poet Kamo and we're talking about how you make cider. We'll be right back. Hi, I'm back with Poet, and we're going to continue. Uh, she's going to tell us how to make this great cider. Mm -hmm. Okay, Poet? Yeah, so our, we were talking about our, our glycol jackets, and really it's just about maintaining um, temperature. And we want to keep temperatures low. That keeps How low? Uh, usually it's like 13 degrees. I mean, it's not super low if you think about, yeah. I mean, when you want a finished product, you probably want to drink it around six, four degrees. Celsius. But when you're making it you need it you need to let the yeast work so they need a little higher temperature so they can do their job. Is the weather affected? Is no, it any different no. in winter than well, that's, summer? That's so that's what's nice with this. So the glycol jacket allows me to maintain the exact same temperature no matter what oh. time of year it is. Um, and then I can have a consistent product and I know what temperatures the yeast like to work at. Um, we also uh, we also crash our product, which means that we bring it down to usually about minus one, and that's when we bring it into our finishing tanks um, and carbonate. But um, the glycol, yeah, it just allows me to basically control what temperature the production is happening at. So there's a tank here to my left. Mm -hmm. There's, you can tell it's very cold. Yes. So what's going on yes. there? Yes. So basically, the glycol, uh, the tank itself has a thermometer, it has a, has a little gauge, and it said, it basically has a little trigger when it gets too hot or too warm, it will trigger the, the glycol to turn on, it open up, it's basically pipes and valves. Um, so it's just recently turned on and because it's so humid, um, it's basically just freezing all the liquid around it. And it's, it's quite cold, like you, I can see ice on it right now. Um, and eventually, it will, once it cools the tank down to the desired temperature, it will turn off, the valve will shut, and it will sit there until something else happens, fluctuates with that temperature. So are any of these tanks ready to be uh, bottled or canned? We, I, well, the one that's actually frosted right now is, is uh, our basically finished cider. We, we actually, yesterday I filtered into um, the bright tank that's behind you, and that will carbonate over this weekend and then it'll be ready to go into kegs next week. So we're always in different stages in here. We're always kind of have, because cider takes six to eight weeks, you kind of make sure you always have cider in different stages so you can keep up with anything. And you do all this work. Yeah, I mean, I have, I have a bit of help, you know. But, I'm amazed. Uh, but it's, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's me kind of, you know, running, the sh running it. Yeah, yeah, you know what. I, I'm calling it. Yeah, I'm calling the shots. Great. So now tell me, you have different, you have Nye Fourth, you have uh, yes. Dark Side, yes. you have District Five, yes. and now what's the, the other? The Lemon Drop. Lemon Drop. Yeah. So how do you get the different? Uh, so it's about creating different blends. So we create different blends for the different styles of cider. Um, and a lot of that, it, you know, happens at different stages. But I definitely wanted to have, we started with my desire to want something that was very dry um, 
I like dry and that's starters. The dark side. And that's the dark side. And so we knew, you know, you know, okay, they get a dry starter. It's, dryness is, is relevant to the sweetness level and not having sweetness or residual sugar in the final product. So we knew we wanted to ferment very dry. We knew we needed to have a, a blend where you had other structure there. Um, sugar is great because sugar can, can create a little structure where maybe you don't have that much. But when you have a dry product, you really want to make sure you have other things like enough tannin or enough mouthfeel um, and, and make sure that the, the acids are all so You're constantly tasting. You have to, yeah. That's probably the perk of the job. I don't know. Do you but have a little lab here? I mean, we do. It's, yeah. it's, it's, it's hidden I right now behind all these cans because we yeah. canned it. Uh, we just canned this week. Um, but um, we, we have to. Yeah, you have to measure your, your pH levels, yes. your, your total acidity, your, um, you know, your, you, you want to do the specific gravity, which basically tells you how much sugar is in there. Uh, but there's a lot of lab work just to make sure that, again, just about being consistent, making sure your products you know, within the, the kind of, you always have a range where you want to be in when it comes to your products. Um, and you want to make sure that you're delivering on that every time. You know, especially if you have a product that has a label, you want to make sure that that cider kind of fits within that, you know, window every time that it's the same because your customer won't be pleased if they no. buy it one day and then come back the next week and it's kind of totally different. How long, how long will cider, what's the shelf life? Again, so I, again, it's more like wine. So wine you usually have, you know, five years. I've had ciders that were 10 years old and delicious. Um, you can do a lot. You can even age. So you can do age cider in barrels, just like wine. Now, it will take in a little bit of those oak flavors, okay. and um, it can round out. You haven't gotten there yet. I, that's on the list. So uh, <laughs> we will get there, but it's, it, we're not there yet. Um, but there's a lot you can do. Cider's very versatile. And as long as it's packaged well, um, then yeah, it can last quite a while. I've seen, I've seen some really nice aged ciders. Why is some in cans and some in bottles? I think part of that I think is just marketing. I think right now we're seeing, um, you know, we're the craft and we kind of, even though production side we're more like wine, Cider really gets lumped in with beer, right? You, you see, now we see beer festivals have cider as well, usually. And so I think it's more of uh, the customers used to getting the product in kind of that 473 ml can. And so for me, it was kind of, well, I want to be convenient. And the can's sure. convenient. Those yeah, single sure. serve cans are convenient. So for me, it was just, I want that convenience. Um, you know, we do try to make premium ciders, so we we kind of took our our easiest 